There's a girl called Corona And she lives in a lab She would like you to come on over But don't go if you're fat There's a girl called Corona And she earned to be free Go ahead, Mr. C. G. Ping said You can do as you please All of my life I dreamed of Corona All of those years I knew that one day she'd come No need to work when I'm with Corona Money for free, a time to chill and have fun There's a girl called Corona And she's only 19 Just a touch is enough to kill you Better keep yourself clean All of my life I dreamt of Corona All of those years I knew that one day she'd come No need to work when I'm with Corona Money for free, a time to chill and have fun All of my life I dreamed of Corona All of those years I knew that one day she'd come No need to work when I'm with Corona Money for free, a time to chill and have fun You're listening to Pod Songs with me, Jack Stafford, where I interview inspiring people in service to others as inspiration for a new song. The song you've just heard was by a good friend of mine, Fraser Bailey, and he asked me to perform it. I've included it at the start of this episode because I'm speaking with an epidemiologist and health economist at Harvard for 16 years. He's American, but has Chinese heritage and was one of the first epidemiologists to warn of COVID-19 on the horizon. Let's learn more from Dr. Eric Feigelding. Safari, the Chrome, but each of them at the end told me, nope, not supported for iOS. No problem. Well, thanks so, so much for taking the time to chat yeah, to me. Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I guess, sorry it took me a while to get back to you. I wasn't really sure. Like, I get, like, a lot of solicitations, and, you know, and some of them are just kind of, you know, junk. And I just, I, I didn't quite quite understand <laughs> your request at first. <laughs> so maybe you can explain, like, you want to do an interview, but then you want to turn into a song or, or how does it work? It's a podcast. So I interview you as a normal podcast. And then at the end of the show, um, I go away and I write a song and I produce it with uh, my musicians. And then we release that song on Spotify and iTunes, and then and we also insert it at the end of the podcast. So when you when you finish speaking, automatically the song will play, um, okay. and it'll be a song inspired by inspired by the conversation. So it could be about it could be about the virus, it could be about the treatment, it could be about your work, it could be about anything. So however we are inspired in our conversation. Sure. Sure. All right, all right. I, I'm I'm not opposed. L- let's let's just do it. I just have to jump off around um, three fifty, three fifty-five. Okay, so, so we have about fifty minutes then. Yeah, yeah. Is that all right? 
Okay, great. Well, let's get this. Let's get. Let's go back a year ago to when you you first heard about the coronavirus. Can you talk me through that? Yes, a year ago. Wow, it's like a lifetime we've been living with this. Um, as some may remember, you know, there was a lot of chaotic information coming out of China about an outbreak there, out of Wuhan, and you know, I, I, I was born in China. I have some relatives, and so Chinese social media was like lighting up, and it's very unusual because normally, you know, if it's something that the government opposes. They shut it down very quickly,、mm. but in certain ways, the government didn't really know what was going on, so it wasn't being censored. But clearly, it was something very alarming, and you know, you're hearing all these really bad horror stories.、Um, but you know, they're just anecdotes, and as a scientist, you can't run with that. But when I saw the first, you know, published paper, a preprint that has an R naught of three point eight. Um, that was like the validation I needed, in addition to all the other anecdotes, which a lot of scientists in the West don't have their ears to, you know, Chinese social media, nor understands how to deal with the signals. So, in certain ways, I knew it was going to be bad, and and I knew it, with pandemics、um, that you have to act fast. Like time literally is of the essence, and lives are the essence, because if the cat's out of the bag. This epidemic is it becomes a pandemic, and so in certain ways, you know, I, I my career is not based in academia anymore. So I'm an epidemiologist.、Um, you know, that was my doctorate, and I felt like if there's one person to shout from the rooftop and have try to be heard and have nothing to lose in terms of my career being thrown away <laughs> if I'm wrong, I decided, you know what, I'm going to go for it. You know, there's there's too much to lose, and you know, personally, my career can handle it. And so I decided, you know, I did my holy mother of God. This it's a three point eight. It's going to be a thermonuclear level bad pandemic. You know, the rivals in nineteen eighteen pandemic from hundred years ago, and you know, the rest is history. But I I got a lot of I got a lot of backlash. You know,、mm-hmm. people called me a fear monger. People called me attention-seeking charlatan. <laughs> Everything、mm-hmm. under the sun.、Um, and my family kind of suffered from it. You know, they harassed my family too. But、um, you know, I I love to be a, have been wrong, right? In certain ways, sometimes you don't know. It's not like a fifty-fifty thing. You know, you if the chance if a, a chance of say an asteroid collision. That's an extinction level event, being one percent.、Um, that's a pretty big one percent, right?、Mm-hmm. And this pandemic, even if it was five percent chance, I'm right. That's a pretty big thing. Now, if I'm wrong, you know what? <laughs> no, no one. I don't think anyone would have really suffered compared to,、uh, comparatively to this pandemic. So I made a calculated thing,、um, you know, and I've been doing. Uh, you know, public health risk communication for a long time. So I knew how to, I knew how to do it, but, but I jumped and dived in on the deep end, and here we are. Yeah, I mean, you were on your own there for a long time. I was researching what the other、uh, epidemiologists were saying at the time, and even Dr. Fauci. I have a quote from here that says it is in February that、uh, the the danger is just minuscule. And we want to take pr- more precautions against the influenza outbreak, which is having its second wave. He said, "You don't、oh, worry、yes. about wearing masks." I remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. February, February last year was it's you know that's when the it's just the flu thing、mm-hmm. was floating around, you know, and then the oh you don't need masks. Oh, and then there's more. There's early on. There's like you know, first of all, in early January, there's no human to human. There's no evidence of human to human transmission. But that's because you don't have any evidence, right? It's not like you have evidence against.、Mm-hmm. And then there's oh, there's no asymptomatic. So February was oh, there's no asymptomatic transmission. You guys are just paranoid. We know right now there is absolutely a crap ton of asymptomatic transmission. That's how the White House outbreak happened because they tested everyone. But someone who was asymptomatic, very low 
viral load somehow got through the rapid tests mm. and got into the White House, spread it to Trump. We know there's this, but in February, like, you know, the, the people in China were telling the world there is asymptomatic transmission. Mm. The people in the West, you know, the, the people sitting in the ivory towers of academia said, well, we're not sure. There's no, I've not seen enough evidence to definitively conclude. No, it, again, in a pandemic, you need to take a precautionary principle. You need to assume it's there, take the precautions that it's there, Maybe prove wrong and, you know, harmlessly prove wrong, mm. but you need to take the precaution because if it's true, it is, again, one of those things that you're going to let the pandemic grow exponentially for a couple more cycles and weeks before you admit that it's true. Anyway, that was February. And then, of course, we're still at this, you know, besides the mass thing, um, you know, airborne transmission, airborne transmission, the aerosol scientists were saying it in the spring, you know, from February and March. But it wasn't heard by the rest of the world until July. And even then, it wasn't updated into the CDC guidelines until September or October. And, and then there was a lot of pushback against those aerosol scientists. I'm not an aerosol scientist myself, but, you know, I'm friends with a lot of them. And it was actually one of them who actually told Fauci and wrote them an email. It's like, hey, Tony, I got to tell you something. You guys are wrong about this, you know, six feet rule. You guys are wrong about these large particles uh, or small particles not, you know, uh, basically falling to the ground. It, it floats in the air. Mm. And, you know, uh, Dr. Kim Prather, she warned Fauci and Fauci realized he was wrong and they quickly changed. But, you know, we lost six months during that time. There's been so many hiccups, mm. you know, and I think certain ways now we're saying, you know, we should switch to premium masks whenever many of us were saying we should have switched to premium masks and invoked the Defense Production Act and told people to get premium masks much earlier. <sighs> you know, like in certain ways, the learning curve in the pandemic is you have to be punished by some really, really harsh data and truth before people actually update the guidelines. And it's just unfortunate. And do you think it's there now with the, with the new government? In America, well, I think I'm I'm very hopeful. I'm really hopeful for, for Biden administration, um, especially Biden's chief of staff is Ron Klain. He used to be Obama's um, Ebola czar back you know six years ago, and back then you know he's he was well known as a skilled like operations uh, person, and you know he planned out the pandemic playbook, laid out everything that got dismantled by Trump when he got there. But he knows what he's doing. This is not his first rodeo when it comes to pandemic. You know, and this is not my first rodeo either. Um, besides that being an epidemiologist, like although I was originally trained as a, you know, chronic disease, cancer, diabetes epidemiologist, you know, our degree is the same degree. Um, you know, back in 2014 during the Ebola epidemic, mini pandemic, um, I developed one of the first uh, contact tracing apps, the digital contact tracing apps, which, you know, you see if, if you and I crisscross within very short distance of each other. At that moment, we don't know we're infected, but if one of us is infected, it stores that all the people who I was close to, and then will retroactively alert them that so five days later after your contact, someone tested positive. Like, you know, I, I built that, but then people laughed me out of the room, you know, because... Mm -hmm. Who in the right mind, like, are you saying that a big biblical level bubonic plague, you know, a pandemic is going to hit San Francisco or New York City? And you're going to have so many people infected that you need this thing to know a proximity meter? And I said, like, yeah. And of course, they laughed me out of the room. <laughs> yeah, there's been loads of movies about that. <laughs> well, what's the chance of that happening? This is not some Hollywood movie, son. But you're a dynamo. I mean, uh, in my research, I saw that you you got a double doctorate in two and a half years. I mean, that's uh, that's going. Yeah, somewhere. yeah. It was it was driven by my childhood. You know, I was a kid who played a lot of video games. Um, you know, I played a lot of Halo, played a lot of Mario Kart. You know, um, but I was hit with a baseball-sized tumor when I was 17 years old. At first, they thought it was non-Hodgkin's because a baseball-sized tumor right here wow. normally is a, 
you know, pretty fatal non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, but, uh, but they eventually did a biopsy and surgery and, and they took it out and realized it wasn't, but I lost part of my lung. So I really shouldn't get COVID. Um, and then <laughs> a few organ pieces here and there. Uh, but it gave me a kick and realized, you know, life is short, lit a fire and, you know, went through college and then grad school. You know, originally I started as an epidemiologist, epidemiology doctor program. And then they're like, you know what, how about you do the double? You don't even have to pay any tuition. It's like, oh, no extra tuition, really? Just double the work. <laughs> um, and it's like, oh, sure, I, I, I'll do it. Um, but, uh, yeah, it was... You no, know, life is short. You know, I went to medical school afterwards, and then I dropped out because it just got, you know, mm. a little too harsh. But, um, but yeah, you were, you were I, I, for sixteen years. Is that right as well? Your yeah, research professor, yeah. A researcher. Although part in the late, in later years, I was part time. Um, I also ran for Congress in two thousand eighteen on the side. <laughs> on the side, yeah, sidekick. Yeah. Um, no, you can't do that as a side gig, please don't, don't ever try. Um, no, I did it full time for a while. It just, there was a redistricting in Pennsylvania. So the district became ungerrymandered and became more fair. And, uh, you know, went to the district where I grew up, elementary, middle, high school. Um, you know, didn't win, but made a lot of friends, learned about the art of public persuasion and mm. public speaking. Do you think so, you have all these skills together? Like you've had such a broad base of experience that it puts you in a better position to to um, <sighs> amalgamate all this, this different data? And this yeah, in certain stuff. ways. Um, you know, like social media, like just so you know, Twitter, I almost never use Twitter. I started my Twitter account like 11 years ago, but you know, I had like less than 2,000 followers for over a decade. You know, I barely ever used Twitter. Um and, you know, but I did in 2007 when I graduated, you know, when I finished my doctorates, uh, I, I got bored uh, and, and there was a program called Causes mm -hmm. on Facebook. Remember with the super poke and uh, the burger smash and all that premiered back on face Facebook back in the 2007? The, the Causes was an app and you could fundraise for any charity or cause. So you didn't have to create a nonprofit. You just choose a nonprofit that you wish. I chose Brigham Women's Hospital at Harvard, which does the Harvard Nurses Health Study, big research project. And I wanted to fund that project. And so I did a lot of cancer research. I created one, you know, support cancer, breast cancer research. That's what it was originally called. And man, it took off. Oh my God, it took off. Um, again, like half a million people in two weeks. And then eventually, you know, it grew to 6 million people. Mm -hmm. And so back then it was integrated with Facebook and you could do one click. So it was integrated with your, you know, your, your newsfeed, you know, the little red flag mm -hmm. that tells you alert. Um, it was integrating that. So back then in the, for the first like three years, you could send a message and it would immediately pop into all these million. Back then it was like two, three, four million people all these millions of people's notifications, like 4 million people's notification box at once. It's not like email where, you know, it, you know, there's an open rate or it's, it's, it's so before the advent of text messaging, you know, mass text messaging technology, it was like the most powerful tool. And back then Facebook was a very fast growing. It's not, it wasn't controversial. It was fast growing. Right. Um, so it was a very powerful medium and, you know, you learn over, um, how many years I did that? Seven years that we were doing that. You, you learn how to communicate. So we did a lot of cancer education um, about how to prevent cancer, you know, just general public education. And you know what works. Mm -hmm. And you also deal with the trolls, people who say, conspiracy theorists who say, uh, you know, you're, you're hiding the cure for cancer. Mm -hmm. It's actually vitamin B17. Now, my second doctor is in nutrition, and there's no, there's no such thing as vitamin B17. So when I see it, obviously, it's like, uh, okay. It's hidden. Nobody's supposed to know about it. Yeah, of course. Of course. No one knows. Not even if you have a nutrition doctorate degree. Um, anyways, but it was, you know, you learn how to deal with trolls. Mm. But you also know what engages, you know, 
what what kind of things that people really uh, need to know and and how to communicate that in a you know like in science communication there's two different kinds there's scientists who want to translate their research great mm-hmm. explain it to a reporter the reporter rewrites it but then there's communication in which look people need to stop smoking this is why smoking is bad you know you know how it's it, it PR firms spend millions of uh, get millions of dollars to design the perfect campaign ad for smoking, right? Mm. Uh, to tell people to stop smoking, and same with you know um, you know why you should stop drinking sugar sweetened beverages mm. causes diabetes and all these other dental caries. And but you can't just say it causes diabetes. Don't drink soda. Mm. It causes lung cancer. Don't smoke. It doesn't work like that. And and the average academic scientists don't understand that. But, you know, when you send enough messages to millions of people over seven years, you know what connects with people. Mm, 10, and you hours. know that sometimes there is nuance, but we have to first bring them in. Because, you know, if you post something that no one sees, like pedantically, you know, so soda causes diabetes and dental and, and cavities, it's not really going to reach anyone. And if it didn't really reach much people... Did it really have an effect? It's like a, if a butterfly flaps its wings, and but no one ever saw it or heard it, did it really happen, right? And so, you know, it, it's an art to of how to engage, how to get people to remember it, and get, how to get them to share it. Mm-hmm. So, um, and of course, how to explain it in a way that they understand. So it's, it's, it's an art that, you know, I've honed over many years. Um, so I guess, you know, when I, when I went away, when causes were shut down, it was acquired by a different company, the platform disappeared. That was a little sad, but you know, that's all right. You had the skills. And, yeah. And then a lot of my research is on social networks and obesity and social networks and diabetes. So in terms of how to engage people, um, this is something that we specialized in. So, because all the a lot of epidemiologists have all seen their Twitter accounts go through the roof, and I've actually oh, had yeah. I've actually had uh, two epidemiologists on the show before, both from Harvard as well. I had um, I had um, for the Great, Bar- Great Barrington Declaration, uh, one of the authors. Um, oh really? Oh gosh! How do you, you're quite a loggerheads with um, with a that them? <laughs> it's the lockdown. Yes, I know. <laughs> Uh, we shall not he who shall not be spoken it's all right it was martin kuldorf that's who i spoke to and he's a lovely guy i mean uh really i mean a lot of, he says it makes a lot of sense no i mean that um uh you know the poorest the, poor, the people of the poorest incomes you know i'm okay staying in lockdown i mean it's good for me i, I get to do this podcast and um but for the poorest members of society and the youngest the youngest members as well, they stay in, having to stay in lockdown is a real, it's a real punishment, both mentally and economically. Yeah. I mean, how do you? Yeah, the lockdowns thing, look, like, first of all, the herd immunity is dangerous. I just want to clarify the Great Barrington thing. Uh, and there's our FAS research team, not, not me per se, uh, someone else on our team, did research that a lot of the people pushing the natural infection herd immunity agenda, the Scott Atlas approach, half of the accounts on Twitter were bots. Mm. It's basically they were un, they were tweeting at unhuman speeds. It was impossible. And so there was a lot of like coordinated misinformation on that for some reason. And same with uh, hydroxychloroquine and all that kind of drama. So, and, uh, you know, I was one of the people pushing back on it. And I got trolled for it. So this is also very key. Now, as for lockdowns, lockdowns do work. Everyone knows that they work. And there's countless studies that show they work. But they are painful. And they are, I would say, one of the last resort things, right? Like, if you can wear masks and everyone has a full compliance and you can avoid this, great. If you have tight quarantine and really a good available piece fast pcr testing rapid antigen testing and really good protocols to uh, for contact tracing that many other countries do you can you can stop this epidemic Mm -hmm. before it gets out of hand at a a, you know this you know simmering ember level you can 
you can quash it and put the fire out. But once it's gone a crazy ablaze, when you have a uh, like basically a wildfire that's completely unstoppable and you're not doing tracing and your testing is delayed and you're only capturing small people uh, proportion testing and people are not wearing masks and, and people are not ventilating indoors and uh, taking the airborne uh, virus caution carefully. When all that is basically gone horribly wrong, you're out of options and you have to lock down. That's the, that sucks. But, if you don't do all the other things, you know, testing, trace, contact tracing, quarantine, and masking, and all these things, then you have to. And it's, it, and then you know, the European countries, for example, whenever they do lockdowns, they subsidize income and even businesses. They subsidize businesses anywhere from fifty to eighty per, uh, to ninety percent. You know, again, they have they have different gradients for um, different things. But we don't have anything like that. Mm -hmm. You know, basically, some countries in Europe, uh, you know, if you are locked down closed, the, the government gives you whatever the 80% of your revenue from prior year was, or your subsidized your wages, 80%. That's it. Mm -hmm. You know, you subsidize until you have to go back to work and then until the lockdown's over. You know, the US does not ha have that. And so what happens is it creates this inequality where if you're an hourly worker, working on a 1099, you know, unsteady, you know, independent contractor income. And then all of a sudden, you know, you can't go to work anymore. Your hours are cut. Um, or if you get infected or if you test positive, you can't go to work anymore. Um, and, and everyone, all your friends, your coworkers who were your co-contacts can also can't work anymore. Then you're not incentivized to go get a test. And you're not incentivized to pick up the phone and answer the contact tracer. You're not incentivized to follow quarantine pro protocols. All these things are connected. If we had actually good, like, um, safety net for Americans, you know, a universal bank income, pandemic uh, relief uh, income, beyond just a one-time or check, mm. it would have been so much better, right? And so here we are. Mm. I mean, Italy. And so much injustice and equality. Yeah, I mean, Italy, and we've, we've been under a very severe lockdown. We weren't allowed out of the house even to exercise. Um, you know, people, even many other European countries, people got fined for going out into the countryside. And, um, you know, as your research from diabetes and obesity, you know that those people are the most at risk and they should have been, they're paid to sit on their couches, but they should have been kick, kicked out of the house to go and do some exercise now to increase their immunity and their health and yeah it's it is so frustrating um i think and right now people have pandemic fatigue mm -hmm. and kids are suffering you know i think the hottest topic now is is also kids the schools the yeah. schools need to reopen right like in the old virus that was less contagious the common strain i would say you could open schools if you do all the other things well, you can open schools because you can afford, you know, school, schools, there is transmission. Anyone who says there isn't are lying to themselves. There's, you know, by the way, during the pandemic, there's a lot of sweet little lies. Like I would say herd immunity is one of those uh, sweet little, the natural infection herd immunity. It sounds so beautiful, right? It, it's, it's, a, it's a solution that solves everything all by itself without acting. Just go and get infected. It's okay. No. No, that's a horrible idea. Horrible. And then there's a, not just death, but obviously long COVID. Um, so there's a lot of sweet little lies. And right now the sweet little lie that a lot of people are telling themselves is um, is that schools can be open without any infection. There will be a reinfection. And by the way, here's the big irony. The CDC says don't gather with friends for Super Bowl games. Don't do it. Don't gather for Christmas. Don't gather for Thanksgiving. Don't have an indoor house party, Super Bowl game with all your friends. But hey, it's okay to go to school and teach with a lot of kids, oftentimes without masks on. You know, so many places don't have a mask mandate for schools. Um, and then, oh yeah, have a caf indoor cafeteria dining for the kids at lunch without masks. And you know how loud cafeterias always get. And you know that there's transmission going on when, when kids are not masked and so the, you know we can't lie 
one thing we can't do is we can't lie to ourselves. Even there, though we know it would be beautiful and nice to do that. Now, I'm not against school reopening, absolutely. We, we just need to do it safely. Why can't we have outdoor tent, tent, you know, um, uh, cafeteria dining? Why can't we buy more HEPA filters? Why can't we have CO2 monitors, which are extremely cheap, in different rooms so you can monitor ventilation, you know, open windows. Now, some places I know people say it's cold or we can't open the windows. HEPA filters. Um, and, and, you know, you oh, it's too cold to have outdoor dining. You know, you know what? Kids can wear jackets and eat lunch for 15 minutes outside. Or you can have bring peat lamps. Like, there's solutions to all this. All these testing kits as well. I, I was in the pharmacy here in Italy, and uh, they have, testing they, they have a home, Europe. Yeah, they have a home test. You can buy it. It's, it's $20, $20 for one test. And they cost about a dollar. Yeah, that's a little, make, that's a little high. Yeah. But if you buy it in bulk, you can get rapid tests in Europe for, like, under five euros. Well, they should, they, cost, they should be a lot cheaper. They should be, like, you know... A, dollar each it should be like one dollar one euro yeah like and it can be that's the thing they can be if you invoke the defense production act which is like the oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, united states wartime mobilization production rule they basically they they, they it's like an eminent domain <laughs> government says it's a wartime emergency mm. you ford motor company make me n95 masks you make me rapid tests do it oh, yeah. you know like you could do it of course trump didn't do it except for burgers and uh and sausages uh to keep the meat and packing factories open um but you can do it anyways because i was thinking there, there's so many you know, it's also, there's so many things it, it, it wasn't of, even a big, it wasn't even a you know the a big enough crisis that it they did all those things maybe if it was just slightly worse you know there might have been better <laughs> you know what i'm saying no. Oh, anyways, we, we need to get schools open, yes. Yeah. We need to do it safely. Mm. That's the key. And I don't think people should lie to themselves. It's it's okay. Nor do I think the government should say sweet little lies that it's okay. Mm. Oh, the OD studies show it's okay. No, the other problem is we don't test children enough. We don't test them that much. Mm. And kids also hate that and nasal pharyngeal oh, yeah. thing anyways. My, my kid cries every time. Um, you know, we just don't test kids enough. So, of course, remember that old mantra, no testing, no pandemic? Mm -hmm. This is the same reason. There's a bias to lower testing than kids, and hence you find less in kids. Now, kids are less susceptible, mm -hmm. but susceptibility is only part of it. Kids transmit more. They have more exposure. Um, you know, this is also part, also the thing in uh, with, uh, the vaccines it's vaccine herd immunity it's not a the key thing her it's not a percentage of people who are immunized it's percentage is a total interaction and here's a main ex example nursing home people elderly bless their hearts they stay home in their nursing home they have very little contact with the outside world a college kid student you know that they go socializing at dorm parties you know, mm. young kids go play on the playground and interact very closely. Kids and young adults probably have 100 to 1,000 times as much interaction as someone who's elderly. So when it comes to actually herd immunity, which is basically the concept of, you know, there's a big room, mm. you have virus on your, you're on the other side of the room. I don't, I don't have virus, but in the middle of the dance floor in this room, ballroom, Half, most of the people are immune then the chance of that virus hop skipping across the ballroom to me is pretty low so right? if you have the if you have the vaccine can you still transmit yes um so again everything's a probability if you have the vaccine will you get infected there's you know overall you know for example pfizer moderna you know one in one in 20 chance you know five percent chance you can get infected chance of you dying low an asymptomatic transmission, which, by the way, other than AstraZeneca, most of the studies had only, um, they didn't do asymptomatic uh, uh, cases. And we know that asymptomatic, it's much lower than symptomatic in terms of prevention. So yes, again, lower chance, but it's still, yes, it's possible.
And so what do you now, do? The, no, so, so going back to a herd immunity, it's not that you say like elderly are 15 percent of the population and you immunize all the elderly. You haven't really achieved 15 percent because the other 85 percent have probably 10 to 100 to 1000 times greater exposure interaction mm -hmm. than at, at some elderly in a nursing home or who stays home all day. Right. And so it's the you need to immunize against 75, 85 percent of all interactions. Right, That makes sense. And that's the key. It is not the people immunizing someone who's a nursing home doesn't go out, protects that person. Yes. Very important. We need to protect them. But in terms of actually slowing the pandemic yet, you know, it's they don't go that much, that much. But if you immunize on a in huge scale like Israel is, you've already immunized, I think, 60 shots per 100 people. You need to get to 200 shots, you know, to two per uh, person. Um, mm -hmm. Then you're going to st start seeing some effect. But early on, you're not going to see an effect. And in certain ways, stopping the spread in young people is just as key because, you know, this B117 has two properties. One, people think it's more, possibly more deadly, 30% more deadly. But that's not the main issue. The main issue is, is it's 50, 60% more contagious. Mm -hmm which means it's going to spread to way more people, increase the denominator by, denominator by a huge amount. And of course, you know, the number of people who die or suffer is actually much bigger uh, with a more contagious virus. So you were right about so, the virus coming. So what's next in the crystal ball? What do you see? What's next is, I, I, uh, I posted about this, is right now, B117 variant, the one from Kent, UK, is so contagious. It's 50 to 60 percent more contagious. Actually, Danish scientists say it's precisely 55 percent more contagious. It's so much more contagious that you know, say you had an R of 0.86. Uh, if you have 1,000 cases today, in two weeks you'll have 500 cases hmm. with the regular strain an R of 0.6. But if you multiply 1. Uh, uh, 0.6 by one you know, 1.6, 60% more um, contagious, you're going to have a virus that goes from 3,000 cases, 1,000 cases to 3,000 cases per day. 3,000 contrasts with 500. That's 6x the number of cases difference in just two weeks. And, you know, basically Denmark and CDC both have modeled it that it's going to basically, it's going to, the B117 is going to take over all these countries. Denmark, it's gone 70% increase per week, per week, mm -hmm. and it's still going up. Netherlands has taken over. Um, in Italy, I don't know if you heard about this village in Italy. Um, they just announced that 10% of the entire village, 1,400 people village, 10%, 140 cases, 10% of the entire village is, in, is infected. And 60% of them infected were kids. In, and the rest were the adults. Oh, and the mayor too. Oh, and they were all B one seventeen variants. We got. I don't we, know if you heard about this. Yeah, we got. It's we, really crazy. We had about hundred. We had about hundred people in our village get the virus, but um, there were no fatalities. So that was a that was a good thing. Well, I think I think no fatalities is good, obviously, but the virus keeps going, and, and it's not just a fatality. Long COVID is a serious problem. Long COVID has been. You know, there's cognitive defects, there's lung problems, you know, long-term neurological organs, your, you know, your liver, your kidney, it hurts all the, and of course, has cardiovascular damage. It, long COVID is bad. It's, so it's not just deaths. I keep telling people, stop just looking at deaths. The long COVID, you know, they actually did a study in the UK of everyone who was hospitalized and got discharged, they were all recovered. Within about a few weeks, about one in, um, I think one in eight, I think one in eight or one in five people basically came back and died. Mm -hmm. It's, it, it, I think it's one in eight died, but huge numbers of them came back when we admitted the hospital. The, the, and, and the people who survived have these huge ailments problems. It, it's, it's a serious problem. And I, and I cannot emphasize it enough. And it's not just deaths. Mm. Did you give some thought to how it begun? Because I was speaking with um, Mark Lipsitch, um, another Harvard epidemiologist, and he was talking because he mentioned 
a few years ago about gain of function research um where they where they deliberately give viruses functions so that if there ever is an outbreak they know how how to how to tackle it and so um, and then yeah. but they do have this is not my favorite topic i'll say okay. <laughs> Because I'm not a, what happens is like, I don't want to fuel any conspiracy theories. Mm. You know, I, this is one of those things I'm trying to be sensitive about. Because I, I don't think we should talk about this, some of these things because it can be easily misconstrued. That said, there was some studies, you know, the, the old SARS and then the new virus. And then along the way, 10 years ago in a PNAS paper, Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, someone engineered the old SARS to gain these furin um, genes that gave it these furin um, parts. And the furin basically cleaves it and allows, facilitates faster um, uptake of the virus. And, uh, you know, this is well documented in the, in the literature. And where they put one of the furins, now the furin is not was not in the original SARS from 2003, but they engineered it in, right? And furin really increases transmission, increases the viral load and increases the uptake. Um, and the new virus has a furin. Uh, we don't know where it got it from. Now, and again, I'm, I'm not a, I do not want to fuel conspiracy theories. And, but uh, we also know that today, there was a new study out that there's huge numbers of recombination. The virus mutates and it recombines, which is a different kind of mutation. Mutates is more like, oh, a whole series of typos and errors accumulated because of random typos in the, in the genome. A recombination is when a virus is swapped genes. I'm going to swap you my section. I'll co copy paste, swap to you, you swap to me. Um, you don't even have to do a two way swap. It basically acquires a gene from another virus. And then it basically, you know, it's like a jigsaw puzzle or recombines, you know, and we know it recombines a lot. And so this is because it recombines so much, it could have gotten some of its properties from anywhere. Right. And so uh, one virus, you know, it's, it's just a very worrisome way. And, and we don't really know. Mm. I don't want to speculate in the air, but I think recombination is, is a potential source of how it started and it is unusual behavior is it or is that well re recombination happens a lot um you know our our sperm and eggs are all recombined um between our parents because mm -hmm. you know we have two copies of our dna right mm -hmm. your mom and your dad mm -hmm. and then now when you create the eggs and stuff it's not like you have a one that's like one egg is all mom, one all egg is all dad, or one sperm all. There's, when you create these eggs and sperm, your mom and dad's thing, uh, your chromatids, chromosome, two chromatids, you actually swap a little bit. Mm -hmm. I'll swap you this part, you swap me this part, and then we're going to make an, a new sperm and egg. This is why brothers and sisters are never alike, because they have each one they're created there and swapping. We're getting a little technical, but my point is, it could have happened anywhere, but you know, the main lesson I want people to take away is not this technical detail, but the longer you let the virus spread, mm -hmm. natural herd immunity, as, you know, Scott Atlas and many right-wingers would say, it's going to basically give way more opportunities for these mutations. Right. And these mutations, you know, when there's no pressure, uh, the, the mutations go in every single direction. But when there's selective pressure, when the walls are closing in on the virus, such as when you use monoclonal antibodies, when you use convalescent plasma on someone, when you have herd immunity, because basically herd immunity, there's less and less people that the virus can infect, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the other Im implication. Basically, the walls are closing on the virus. So whichever virus happens to mutate something that can get over the fence of the wall that's closing in, that's the winner. So it creates a selective pressure. Um, so all these things, they add together. And I can't emphasize enough that we got to stop the transmission. We cannot let it float for a couple more million infections. That just, 
is the perfect recipe for disaster. So what would you say to people who are who don't want to get vaccinated? I would say think of your family, think of your community, right? Think of your kids. This you want your kids to go back to school. You want to protect your community and your loved ones. Um, it's more than just yourself. And look, and the other thing is, it's not some conspiracy theory to make. There's no, there's no implants or chips or something like that. It's you know, rich people take it, and the other key is rich people die from it. Um, and by the way, that's one thing I learned uh, from all my years of posting about cancer prevention. Whenever I saw a cancer conspiracy theory, one of the best ways to shut down a conspiracy theory is, let's think about it this way. If it's conspiracy, presumably the rich and powerful will find a way out of this, right? Mm -hmm. But look, Steve Jobs died of cancer. If, if cancer, withholding a cure for cancer, which is the conspiracy theory on cancer is, you know, that you withhold a cure for cancer for to make more profits for pharma mm -hmm. or, or, or research grants, which... God forbid, you have no idea how science really works, funding really <laughs> works. It's, but if you think about that, like if Steve Jobs, a billionaire, still died of cancer, hmm. you, you don't think he would have used his billions of dollars to save his own life? Like I think of how many rich people have died and powerful people have died of cancer. There's no conspiracy. If rich people, start die, if rich people die of this stuff, famous people die of this stuff, it's not a conspiracy. And if they take vaccines, it's not a conspiracy. And similarly, we've seen, we've lost many people to COVID. Larry King, Captain Moore, um, and and so many other uh, people. It's not a conspiracy. That I think that's the best, easiest way to understand. Right. You know, and polio. How many I people think, have saved been saved from polio by vaccines? Mm -hmm. Say again. How many people have been saved by from polio thanks to vaccines? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And so then, there, of course, you can use the academic argument. Like, there's two arguments. There's, again, I, in certain ways, I think less like an academic. I try to position how to think like a conspiracy theorist, how they would think um, if I were in their shoes. But the academic answer is, of course, smallpox vaccine, measles vaccine, polio vaccine has saved hundreds of millions of people in this century alone. Hundreds of millions. Um, you know, I, I actually, because I was born in China, I still have the smallpox vaccine here, the, the bifurcated needle here that no one has anymore. And so I think the most, one of the most memorable cartoons I saw was there was a kid who asked his mom, Mommy, what's that? Um, it's my smallpox vaccine. And the kid said, why don't I have one? And the mommy says, because it worked. <laughs> because we eradicated it right and that's why you don't need it anymore and i think and it, was, it was such a very you know revealing it was actually one of the most highly retweeted uh cartoons i ever posted i didn't you know it was obviously insightful i didn't think it was that powerful but you know it taught me that something like that simple could resonate yeah you know it was a very simple cartoon um it was just a few words and it was so beautiful in that way I think those kind of things, when you resonate these messages with people, hmm. look, the rich and powerful are dying of this as well. Why do you, don't think it, you, you know, it's, this is going to spare you. Hmm. Don't think that this is some mass, you know, master conspiracy. There's no Jewish space laser here, uh, thing <laughs> or, or any 5G microchip. Like they wouldn't even fit a microchip. I don't even know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> so long story short, Vaccines save lives. No one is above this disease. Hmm. No one's above this vaccine. And think of your kids. We want our kids to go back to school, right? And don't rely on herd immunity. Because look, there's reinfection. The new variants also evade immunity. And there's long COVID. Even if you do survive, there's long-term COVID damage. Just don't do it. Hmm. Vaccine is the safest way. If you want your life back to normal, like, and I think once people are pressured, and especially when school reopens, um, you know, there, there's a movement that we expect to, to develop when the vaccines become prevalent, and that's the vaccine passport. 
You want to go to concert? Show me your vaccination. Just like, you know, how kids mm. have to show vaccinations to go back to school. You want to tra- fly on this plane? Show us your vaccine. Like, it won't happen yet because vaccines are not prevalent enough yet. But once it becomes prevalent and common by fall this year or next year, it's going to become the thing. Show me your vaccine. Right? And then in certain ways, it's going to create a pre- peer pressure. If you want to participate in society, if you want to go to this birthday party, you want to go to this um, this indoor boxing or NBA basketball concert, you have to show your vaccination. I think eventually people will come around. Mm. They won't like it, but they will come around. And ultimately, if you want to send your kids to school, they will come around. So what message, is that the message you'd like to put into a song for more people to hear? Uh, they don't want, no, I don't want to, <laughs> I, I don't want to make that the message they will come around because it sounds very elitist. No, but I mean so, more about, um, you know, the, 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 the vaccine, take a vaccine. Yeah. Take a vaccine, take a vaccine to protect your family. I would say like, no one's above it. Like, mm. you, you know, I was saying about the wealthy, no one's above this disease. I think that's really key. Um, Take a vaccine to, so you can go back to normal life, so you can send your kids back to school. Um, I think that, that's a really good message. Um, the virus doesn't care about it doesn't care about what you believe politically. You know, it doesn't care you. It doesn't care if you believe in natural infection herd immunity. It would actually it would actually love it, right? Um, yeah, I think those are the major points. The, oh, also the virus is airborne. It's airs. Please take precautions. You know, we didn't, you know, in certain ways, we didn't know that there was asymptomatic transmission. There was. We didn't know that there was airborne transmission or people, people said it didn't happen. People still say it doesn't happen. Um, but they're idiots. <laughs> um, but they, it happens. We know it happens. Uh, and we know that it's actually a huge dominant role in transmission. Take out my idiots thing. Don't quote me on okay. the idiots. No thing. idiots. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I think it's just, I think people need to take precaution. The precautionary principle is so key. This is a pandemic we have not seen in over 100 years. It's, it is as deadly as, and dangerous, even if you survive, as can be. You know, excess deaths, the U.S. is up over, well over half a million excess deaths now. And by excess deaths, it means the total deaths exceeding seasonal averages. We're like half a million over, at least. It is it's so deadly. Um, so destroying of people's lives not because of the lockdown but because you know the virus has destroyed and decimated people's families especially among minority communities is really been really it's been really hit hard so um i guess i have to leave it there all right well, uh, that's been great thanks so much you've you don't speak like an yeah. academic you know i mean you're very uh you come across as very passionate as well. I mean, so yeah, I, I, I'm not an academic anymore. I'm trying. I'm trying to communicate in a way that the the lay public can understand. Mm-hmm. You know, because you, know, you can publish all you want. You can be as you know careful of the word, and and you know, Dr. Mike Ryan, the director of emergency uh, programs at WHO, said. If you want to wait until you're absolutely right about something before you act, you will lose against this pandemic, against this virus. You know, basically hesitation is is how you lose this pandemic. Uh, you have to act fast, have no regrets. Pandemics are just like that. Whenever outbreaks happen, you have to move quickly or else more people will suffer. And even if it's less contagious than thought, you know what, you still save people's lives. And so please, everyone, wear a mask, 
but try to wear a premium mask. Distance, but know that indoors you have to ventilate. And outdoors, you know, it's, it's, you can't entirely be safe. So please, please, you know, do what you can to end this uh, uh, pandemic so our kids can go back to school. So our kids can go back to school. I think that's the bottom line. Do it for our kids because the longer the pandemic is, you're not just harming yourself, but you're harming our next generation. All right. Thanks, Eric. All right. All right good luck. Take Cut care. out the parts where I, where I, cur- where I swear or curse. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I don't want I don't want this to be where I'm too inappropriate in some places. But no, you were great. All right. Good luck with editing. Thank you. Take care. Bye. All right. Bye. It's often hard to know what to do. You hear different arguments, points of view. What is wrong and what is true on the subject of the virus? But our attitude to mortality, how we feel about authority, filter and form all our opinions, or am I being righteous? But if in doubt about how to act, then always do what's best for other people. Wear a mask that filters well Wash your hands, distance and gel Posts about conspiracies And if in doubt about vaccines Browse horrible photos of defeated diseases But defects bought on by rubella The terrible shock of chicken pox Parents in hysteria, kids with diphtheria Vaccine Would you like hepatitis or rotavirus? not a topical song, I don't know what is. Thanks to my musicians Maurizio Sanicola, Massimino Vozza, and my researcher Dori Verbo. Thanks to you, the listener. If you could continue their work, if you could share this song, find it on Spotify, YouTube, Deezer, iTunes, share it with your friends. Please subscribe on YouTube, subscribe on your applica- on your podcast application. All these little things help feed the algorithm and help the song and the podcast reach more people, which is why we do it. All right. Thanks very much. See you next time.